to me, to the church, and to everyone. I don't know if my, my wife Ellen or even uh, Christelle or even mom, my mom, whenever starting Thursday, Friday to Saturday, that whenever we eat, I'm not just praying for the food, I'm praying for the church. When I say I'm praying for the church, I'm praying for everyone in the church. And my specific prayer, because during that time, if I may use the word struggle, I'm already struggling in prayer, battling in prayer, that all of God's people will be here on Sunday. I think it's the dilemma of every pastor who pastors a church. If there is one joy, one joy, or the greatest joy that a pastor could have is to see all of God's flock that belong to that particular church be there at church on a Sunday. And if there is one thing that would make a pastor sad, and to open my heart to you today, if I may confess something, the thing that really makes me sad is during Sunday morning, probably some of us might be thinking, you know, Pastor, I think you should be doing the opposite, that you should be looking forward to go to church, to be worshiping the Lord with God's incredible people. Yes, I am with you in there. Because I love going to church and I love having the opportunity to dig into God's Word, to listen to God's Word. And you know what? Even as I preach, even as I share the Word of God, I myself is being encouraged and edified by the Word of God. So it blesses me as well to share and preach the Word of God. But what I am sad about is when people miss church, when people are not here, what God had prepared so much each time we gather here, we miss it because we are not here. Another reason at times I am so sad during Sunday morning is when people are not here, when you are not here, we miss out the opportunity to share our contribution to the share of Christ. When I say contribution, I'm not talking about money here. What I am talking about, your presence. Because you yourself, as you come here, you become an encouragement. And let me tell you this, like what I have said, at one point, I think I have spoken this several times, that as you come here, the mere fact that I see your face and you're seated there in your places, it just brings joy to me. It brings encouragement to me. I think at one point I have already told you that, what if a host has prepared whole day and even not slept the whole night just to prepare food, cook food. Because he has invited all these guests, these visitors, he, he labored, he toiled. But unfortunately, on the time that the event took place, only a few people showed up. How disheartening probably for that person who had really spent so much time in preparing food to honor and serve and to bring joy and delight to his guests only for people not really to give the time of day to come or even call and say, I could not make it. And so, in our hearts or in my heart, if there is one thing that will bring joy to me every Sunday morning, is to see you all here. That all of these chairs, they're all filled out with our families your family with the church family. You see, each and every one of us, in fact, this is written in Romans chapter 12, verse 5, to start with. So in Christ, we who are many, we form one body. And each member belongs to all the others. In short, all of us, we form the body of the Lord Jesus Christ here in this local church. And that each and every one of us, we are important. Just like the part of our body, 
probably the the littlest toe that we've got there on the on the left or the right foot. What is the purpose of that little toe? You could not even uh, uh, paint a pedicure on it. It's kind of crooked like a ginger. But what is the purpose of that? But that in itself, God has placed it there for a purpose and for a reason. And so each and every one of us, we might see ourselves not standing up here or not even doing significant things. But it does not mean that you are not important. You are important in the eyes of God. And much more, you are important in my eyes. That like what I have said time and time again, if you want to encourage me, come to church. Let me see you each time we gather in worshiping and honoring the Lord. You may not say things to me. You may not say, Pastor Jay, I encourage you because that in itself, I may not want to hear, but the very mere fact that I see your face and your presence here, listening to the Word of God, brings encouragement. Each and every one of us, we have something to contribute to others. And you see, it benefits both ways. Probably, as I stand in here, and I exhort and encourage you with the Word of God, you yourself, some of us, probably those who are not sleeping, those who get the message, probably they are being blessed. <laughs> they are being encouraged, strengthened. They are being given inspiration to face another week as they go through in life. And in the same manner, like what I've said, it, 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 is, it has mutual benefit. It probably encourages some of us, but encourages me as well. So both ways, you are being encouraged and you being an encouragement to others as well. Are you with me today? We're like light. As we gather together, the brighter we become. Are you with me? And another reason, probably at times, I would say, I'm not really so very pleased and very happy as a pastor here in this church, is that I am sad when I see some parents or even some of us Christians that are here who choose other activities on Sundays over church attendance. Because it just brings a wrong signal and a wrong message to our children, to our kids. We are teaching them that church is not important. If we go to the park, if we go to sports, if we go to the mall, if we just sleep over at home because it's much comfortable to stay at home than to go to church, you know what? That is what our children pick up. And so when they grow older, when they are on, on their own, we can never ever force them or even tell them to go to church because they have not seen it from us. It has not developed in their heart that church is something that is important. Church is something that we can go and then skip on later. If there is really one thing that saddens the heart of a pastor, it is when people or God's people do not come or miss the church. I am not trying to be negative or to make you feel guilty if you have missed a service or two. Because at times, I totally understand that we've got some legitimate reasons why at times we could not go to church or we are unable to attend. Probably some of us, we get sick or others are at work. They are really, it is on their schedule. Some of us, we don't have transportation. Or some of us, we've got other reasons. But I thank God for those brothers and sisters here who go to Burlington just to pick brothers and sisters to bring them to church here. God bless you for what you're doing. 
And those brothers and sisters who bring brothers and sisters here who don't have really any cars or vehicle, God bless all of you. You just don't know that you are doing a great ministry for God. Amen. We could have a litany of all reasons, but here's just the thing. I understand that in our generation, in our culture, there seems to be a growing disposition in our culture against church. I mean, church nowadays, or church att attendance, is just is a thing that is just taken so lightly. You know, the first time I... I um, the first service we had here in JOV, North Carolina, the first service we had, Sunday service, formal Sunday service, I mean me as the pastor, I think it was January or February, and our first service, there was a heavy snow. And all churches were canceled. I mean all. I mean everyone. I mean on the news. Um, because of that heavy snow. And I told myself, Lord, is it in this culture to cancel church in this event? Because, of course, in the Philippines, it's not snowing. And even in the Philippines, if there is typhoon or whatever calamity, church still church. Yeah. We're not canceling anything there. And so, so the church where we're supposed to meet is closed. So we decided to have church in a, brother, in a brethren's house. So we had church that morning. First Sunday to preach in this church. And it was canceled. But I told my heart and my, my, my Lord said, No, Lord, I believe that you will protect us. Amen. Amen. Are you with me today? Amen. I heard about a golfer, I don't know if you've heard his story, who was 20 minutes late at the first tee one Sunday morning and the other three members of that regular foursome were almost ready to start without him when he finally arrived the golfer gave this explanation I agreed with my wife that this Sunday I would toss a coin to see whether I played golf or go to church he said Heads, being tossing the coin, heads, I played golf. Tails, I will go to church. Wouldn't you know it, I had to toss the coin 43 times before it came up heads. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is just the reality. You've got 1,001 reason not to go to church. Another story I believe that you have heard. This. One Sunday morning, a mother tried to wake his son for church. And so the son replied, Mom, I'm not going. The mom asked, and why not? The son said, I will give you two reasons for me not to go to church. First, they don't like me. <laughs> Second reason, I don't like them. <laughs> and the mom said, you know what son, I will give you two reasons to go to church. First, you're already 54 years old. And second, you're the pastor of the church. <laughs> You know what, at times, to be honest, as pastors, we come to the point, I don't know we Pastor Noel, but at times, we come to the point of discouragement that we don't want, really, to go to church as well. But the thing is that, who's going to preach? <laughs> so, as humans, we have to bring ourselves to church. There are some reasons why some Christians don't come to church. Well, these are not exhaustive, but at least probably you may find your reasons here. First reason is 
bad experience as a church. Probably a greeter or an usher didn't greet you. Or the pastor really uh, missed to say hi to you. Or probably you have interpreted that somebody really is giving you the look. <laughs> so bad experience. We tell ourselves, you know what, I don't want to go to that church anymore. They're all bad experience. Another, church is boring. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> church is boring. Another is guilt and shame. We don't want to show up to church because when we hear the word or when our brother and sister look at us, it is as if we are being stripped and we know what we did last night. <laughs> it's the guilt and shame. Isn't that right? But you see, it's not really the brother and the sister really that brings it that. It is the Spirit of God. Are you with me? Personal sin. Another thing. Or the pet sins. If there is a pet sin. There are things that we probably or some churchgoers are still doing. That's why it keeps them from fellowship. There are still those personal issues. Conflict with another Christian. Especially if that Christian is your wife or your husband. <laughs> you don't want to go to church. Personal pain. Headaches. Tooth aches, ear aches, nose aches, all kinds of aches. <laughs> Amen? But the thing with this ache or the thing with this pain is that if we are achy or in pain on Monday morning, we don't have a choice. We'll go to work anyway. But on Sunday, if we are achy or painy, <laughs> we have all the reason not to go to church. Amen. Another sickness. Well, like what I've said, if you're really sick, especially if you got the norovirus, I mean the contagious disease, just stay at home. Sports. Okay, especially, I thank God that um, the Mani Pacquiao thing, it's a Saturday night. But the only thing is that those who get up late, it's a problem. In the Philippines, it is being televised, I think, around noontime. And so our church in the Philippines, we've got two services. We've got the 8 o'clock service, and we've got the 10 to 12 service. Guess what? All people, they're all in the 8 to 10 service. <laughs> and no one in the 10 to 12, even, the, even pastor at times. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he will kill me. No, because everyone, they want to be there to watch Manny Pacquiao. But I praise God, Mani Pacquiao lost. So probably Christians might realize now that church is important. <coughs> Busyness. How busy are you? We're so busy, Pastor Jay. Reminder, God has given us seven days. First five days to work. Saturday should be a day of rest. Sunday should be a day of rest. But some of us, we're still working on a Saturday. That's okay. But Sunday... It should be a day of rest. Remember, it is part of the commandment of God. Remember to keep the Sabbath day holy. Meaning when we say holy, we need to rest. It's not just for God's benefit, but it is for you. Those bodies are not machine. They need rest. Like what Pastor Noel has said, we're growing old. Amen. You don't have the stamina of an 18-year-old if you are 60. You cannot do what a 20-year-old is doing if you are already 65. Are you with me today? Next one. Oh, I love this. Laziness. <laughs> plain, just plain laziness. Hallelujah. Amen. Next, work. Praise God. Like what I've said, God has given us Seven days, five days, God said we need to work. And at least one day, we need to rest. To honor, worship God, and also for us. Transportation issues, praise God, like what I've said. Those who are going out of town, those in a funk. I don't know what funk means, but those in a funk. Another one, 
reason. Sunday is my only day to sleep in. Well, here's the good news. Here's what I have to say to that. Come to the service and join others who catch up on their sleep during the sermon. I would even give you a comfortable blanket to go with it. At least I would see you here at church. Another reason, I don't like the pastor's personality. You don't like it? Me either. <laughs> I don't like the pastor's preaching. Well, join the club. <laughs> Last one, I'm just out of the hobbit. I'm just out of the hobbit. You know what? I think the last one is very common. And from my experience as a pastor, most people don't come to church on a regular basis, have not necessarily made a decision to not come. It's just that they get out of the habit of coming. They got out of the habit of coming. They miss one week, and that, that one week will lead to two weeks, which then later would turn into a month. And you know, if we skip church on Sunday, there are other habits that are being formed to replace the time that we're supposed to go to church. And then, the thought of coming back after you have skipped church for several weeks, and then when brothers and sisters would, uh, would, uh, would, uh, would greet you, oh, where have you been? What happened? It just bring what? It just bring embarrassment. Yes. And then we think, you know what? This is the reason I don't want to go to church anymore. <laughs> I feel embarrassed and people are asking me what happened. So it's just a cycle. You know what? To go really into that serious side, our church attendance reflects how much we honor, how much we bring priority and even importance with our relationship with Christ. It just reflects your relationship with the Lord. If you're a person who come here and then stop there, I think it might reflect how serious are we with our relationship with the Lord. Pastor Jay, who are you to judge me? I'm not judging. What I am telling you today is how you bring importance or put importance in your worship with the Lord. It will just show how you honor the Lord in your life. They always say that action speaks louder than your words. It is your action that would speak how much you love the Lord. I always say, talk is cheap. Right? We talk all the time. It's cheap. But it is when we put actions into those words that will just bring meaning and essence and insignificance and significance with what we do. I would like to dive with the scripture that we have today. In fact, it is Hebrews chapter 10, verse... 23 to 25 and this is the the particular scripture that we are studying in our Timothy training I would like to encourage you to come in our Timothy training every Sunday at 9 30 in the morning this is our discipleship class and that particular topic that we're discussing is about fellowship or lesson about fellowship and the importance of fellowship before we would go and read this, I'll just give you a background about the context. So the book of Hebrews, actually the author is unknown. The book of Hebrews was primarily written for Christians with Jewish background who were wavering in their faith. So probably, just like us, at times we waver in our faith. Some wanted to go back to their old life because of the problems and even of persecutions that they were experiencing. Weaving several warnings with rich doctrine, the author urges his readers to hold fast and not to go back. And so in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25, if you may help me read, please, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess 
For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. But let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. I have formed some outline today, and then they're not really fancy outline, but the outline that I'm going to use today, I would give you four points that we will get out from this scripture. The first point that I would like to bring to you out from scripture, this particular scripture is, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, that is, found in verse 23. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess. Believers back then, as well as believers today, we face a myriad of trials, distractions, and problems. Literally, we're to keep on holding fast and to make sure that we do not falter. So the word unswervingly there means to get fast hold of something. So what the author is encouraging the Christians is to hold, to hold on something. Unless they will be swayed away by something. Are you with me today? So the author encourages us to hold on fast. Hold tightly. Hold tightly to the hope that you are confessing. Hold, you have to hold tightly to the faith that you are professing right now. Whatever you are believing, whatever you, are, you have received, whatever faith you have in Christ, you have to hold on it tightly. Amen. Unswervingly. <coughs> Amen. And why? Good thing because it tells us there because it has actually a reason. It has an incentive at the last phrase of this particular verse. Because he who promised is faithful. I praise God for that. Because God is faithful to us. Amen. And so we can be faithful to him. This is a promise and God never breaks his promises. God never over promises and he never under delivers. Amen. Hallelujah. Are you with me? God is not like the lover who I will uh, I will catch the stars in the sky and I will make them a necklace on your neck. That is over. But God is not over promising. And he never under delivers. But he does what he said he would do. Are you with me today? I've got a question. What if God decides that he would be faithful in accordance to our faithfulness to him? We're in big trouble. The Bible says God is faithful. But even if we are unfaithful, still he is faithful. Because he could not just break that character in him. But I thank God every day that at times I fail. At times I am unfaithful, but he remains faithful. He does not reward my unfaithfulness with misery or because you know what? Because you have done this, I'm going to do that. At times we parents, we are conditional with the way we deal with our kids. At times. It has to meet certain conditions in order for them to get something. If you are good, okay, you're going to get this. Roll over. Sit. Jump. <laughs> Amen. But praise God. God is not like that. Amen. Amen. Because like what I've said, if God will base His faithfulness with our faithfulness, we're already long dead and gone. 
another. Let us consider how we may spur one another on. That is in verse 24. The word consider means to think about with affection and attentiveness. The word consider means to think about with affection and with attentiveness. This alone is quite challenging because most of us, by default, focus on what we can get, on, not on what we can give to others. Isn't that right? At times you always think about, what about me? And I was told by somebody, and this is really true. I mean, if all of us will all have our, all of us will just come here. And uh, our pictures will be taken from here. Who is the first person that you're going to look? Yourself. Yourself. <laughs> <laughs> you will not see or you will not look or probably, at times probably if you've got a crush or if you've got uh, with the, those, uh, those teenagers really are into, they would look for the, uh, for, for the person who, who is of interest to them. But most of the time, it just show off our what? Self-centeredness. The self still. If we look at that picture, the first person that you're going to look is, how do I look? <laughs> right? You or me. And so, the Bible is telling us that before we look at ourselves, let us consider other first. Meaning, let us think about others with affection and with attention. Because that is the only way that we could best minister to them. If we look intently, what do they need? What can I do? How can I help? Amen. The word spur... S-P-U-R is translated as provoke. I know provoke in itself is not quite a good word, is it? It's not a positive word. But you see, as it was translated in the King James Version, the word provoke can be interpreted two ways. Either in a positive sense or in a negative sense. So the word spur in the negative sense means to, to incite or to irritate. We don't like that. We don't like irritating people, do we? We don't like to be irritated. Oh, you don't like me when I'm irritated. Another word that is translated, it is a positive equivalent of the word spur, is to rouse, to rouse one to action or to excite. So that in itself is something that is good. To get excited. Amen. To spur means to let others get excited or to rouse into action. So we are to create a convulsion, a seizure. How many here have convulsions with a uh, bubble bath? The, the thing is that we are to, to create a convulsion, in other words, towards love and good deed. Or to paraphrase it, let's see how inventive we can be. So we should be inventive to one another in in causing them to do good deeds towards to one another. Are you with me? So in short, how can I serve my brother or my sister? How can I be an encouragement to this brother or to this sister? Amen. Oh, probably I can make some pinakbut. I can cook some sisig. Tinuguan. Praise God. Just think about that and you know what? How how it just it would just make your day. 
This morning we received the call from a sister and, and said, uh, Sister Ellen, we're going to go to your house today and we're going to bring some dinuguan. Wow! And Ellen's so excited. I think even with those simple gestures, it could just encourage you so much. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. People of God. I pray that we have the heart really that our joy is to make other people happy. Amen. Amen. It may not be cooking. It may, may be other things. But it is for us really to be inventive in doing good things for other people. Because that is how we may spur one another towards good deeds. Amen. Amen. It was said that the church of Jesus Christ, according to James MacDonald, he said that the church of Jesus Christ is not, is not like Walmart. Or we've got a brother here from Harris Theater. The church of Jesus Christ is not like Harris Theater for the upper class. <laughs> but for us, I, I like Walmart. Amen. <laughs> We've got a manager here from Harris Theater. This is going to cross me out. So the Church of Jesus Christ is not like Harris Theater or Walmart, okay? Why, Pastor Jay? Because when we go to Walmart or to Harris Theater, it's not like you go, get what you came for, and then you head home again. The church is not just about you getting what you need. Yes, I know. You give your prayers, I mean, you ask for prayers, you ask God to do this and to do that. But that in itself is not, the whole scenario is not complete. Church as well involves, it is about you participating in what everyone needs. In short, we meet one another's need. What do you mean, Pastor Jay? About material needs, but probably just a smile in our face or just a warm handshake. Just a reassurance, I have this problem. You know, at one point, my wife always tells, uh, it, it just rebuked me at one point. At times, my wife tells what happened th uh, through her day at work. Problems, or at times, things that she feels. At times, uh, at the back of my mind, I'm telling, you know what, I cannot solve everything that you say that you tell me, but then again she rebuked me, I don't want you to solve them, I just want you to hear, I just want you to listen. Now I got it. Whenever she speak, I'm just there to listen. You know people of God, probably you might learn with my ignorance. People do not ask solutions from us. Probably what they need at times is just a listening ear. Probably who would, who would just be there to listen and say, it's going to be okay. I'll Amen. be praying for you. Amen. Isn't that encouraging? Mm -hmm. But the thing is that we feel like we are obligated to solve the problem. That's why we don't, you know what? I don't want to hear it. I have so much problem on my, on my own. <laughs> just. So probably that brother, that sister really needs is somebody really to listen. Amen. A brother or a sister who's not in a hurry. That if somebody's talking to you, don't be looking at your, at your watch. <laughs> it seems like, hurry up, please, your time is up. <laughs> you know what? A church is a community of families all working together so that church can be all God wants it to be. The church is made of imperfect people. Amen. This is not a perfect church. We are not a perfect church. If you are looking for a perfect church, I, I think you'll be disappointed. You'll be frustrated because there is no, there's no one here. Amen. And just in case you, found, you, you, found, you, you find one, Pastor Man said, 
Don't go there. Because the minute you step in there, that church will become imperfect. <laughs> because you will bring imperfection. The third one. Let us not give up meeting together. Like what we do right now. Let us not give up meeting together and in fact in the next in the next slide it just reminds me of the church sign that says the letters ch blank ch what's what's missing <laughs> you are it's so cheesy but it's true right <laughs> a church will not be church without you so you are missing in that church Amen. So don't be missed. In Luke chapter 4 verse 16, Jesus have seen the value of attending synagogue every Sabbath. If Jesus have seen that attending church or synagogue every Sabbath is important, how much more we, amen, that we need to hear the word of God, to be strengthened and encouraged, to be lifted up by one another. Luke 4, 16. And on the Sabbath, Jesus went into the synagogue as was his custom. You know what? We were created for community. But here's just a weird truth about us human beings. All human beings say amen. amen. While we long for community, we also ran from it. Isn't that true? It has been said that when humankind fell from grace, that's from Adam, we inherited not only the tendency to hide from God, but also the tendency to hide from one another as well. <coughs> we struggle with conflicting desires. On the one hand, we desire to be close with one another. But on the other, we want to hold others at arm's length. Amen. There is a book that was written by Miroslav Volk, and the title is Exclusion and Embrace. And he says that there are really only two options available to us in relationship. We can embrace people, take them by the hand, do life with them, and open our heart to them. That is the first option. So open our heart, embrace people, take their hands, open our heart to them, and do life with them. And the second one is to exclude others. Close our hearts. Grow cold and distant as we shut people out of our lives. Brothers and sisters in the Lord, we are not in Antarctica, North Pole or South Pole. We're not frigid weather here. But we as brothers and sisters in the Lord, we need to be doing life by embracing one another. Amen. My question is, are you intentionally or unintentionally excluding people in your life? What do you mean unintentionally? Unintentionally because some of us, we get the impression that we are so snob or so proud and arrogant because we don't normally talk with people. So probably us, oh, you know what? That is unintentional. That is not real me. So people feel that you are excluding them because of probably your personality or the way you are. In Tagalog, suplada. <laughs> so they feel that we are like that. But my real question is, are you true in excluding people? If we are people of God, it's time for us to change. We want this church to be a caring community. We need to be embracers and not excluders. Amen. We need to have everyone part of our group. Hallelujah. 
Praise God. Another phrase that I would like us to use or to see, the next phrase says, as some are in the habit of doing. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. It is easy to get out of the habit of church participation. Too many of us plug in, then we back off. Non-participation can become habit forming. Probably some of us have watched in National Geographic all this uh, or, or, or this uh, nature documentaries on TV that when a lion stalks a herd of gazelles, he goes after the one that was straying from the herd. So the one that separates from the rest of the herd is the one that is being attacked by the lion. So people of God, the Bible says in 1 Peter that the devil out there is like a growling, roaring lion. He is seeking whom he may devour. But he may devour only those who separate themselves from the rest of the herd. We are the herd of God. We are the flock of God. The moment you separate yourself, you are prone to the attack of the enemy. Amen. So that we could safely say that the church is your covering. The church is your protection. As you are with the, uh, the, uh, the union of, uh, of your brother and your sister's prayers and, and fellowship, you are being covered by the protection of God. But the moment we leave that covering, that church, we are exposing ourselves to so much danger. There was once a study that was disclosed that if both parents attend church regularly, 72% of their children remain faithful to church attendance. That is if both mom and dad attend to church, their children, 72% of the time, their kids will be faithful to the Lord and their church attendance. If only dad attends, 55% remain faithful. So you see, dad, how heavy the percentage it is if you lead your family to the Lord. 55% of kids. And if mom attends, only 15% remain faithful. But much better than none, right? 15% remain faithful. If neither parent attends on a regular basis, only 6% of children will remain faithful. Our faithful church attendance affects the faith of our family. And this carries into the next generation. Do you want your family to be, to be blessed? Do you want your next generation to be blessed? Do you want your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren to be blessed of God? What is that one thing you can do for them? Be faithful to the Lord. Because God said, God shows His kindness and faithfulness to the generation of those who are faithful to Him. So if you are faithful to God, God will just show His favor, His kindness, His goodness, even to your great, 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 great grandchildren. Are you with me? Because you were faithful. And that is the best thing that we can leave our family to be faithful to the Lord. Amen. Our absence from church communicates to our children that God doesn't really matter. And it is so sad. We are pushing our kids when they're teenagers to go to church. When all the time, when they were little, they were not. Okay? They were not trained. They have not seen it from us. Faithfully committing ourselves going to church. And I really admire those children that they, they, are, they are the ones who are rebuking their, their, their parents. These children said, Today is Sunday. Are we not going to church today? And they, they would even say, Mommy, are you already a backslider? <laughs> Did you forsake Jesus already? <laughs> because these kids really rebuke their parents. And praise God for these children. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. That they got the word. 
And parents, if you hear your, your kids say that, don't say, shut up. <laughs> Just say, yes, Lord, I hear it. And go to church. The last one, the fourth one, this last one. But let us encourage one another. But let us encourage one another. The word but introduces a contrast. What is that contrast? Even if we attend services, if we fail to encourage others, we have not really obeyed this verse to the full context or extent of it. Notice that this let us is in contrast to being in the habit of not meeting together. So to say it in another way, it is impossible to encourage others if you are not engaged with others. You, you cannot encourage other people if you are not into them. How can you encourage a stranger? Or I mean, if a person would listen to you, make sure that he knows you. This is what really the whole point. But let us encourage one another. Amen. The word encourage means to put courage in. And in the Greek, this means to call to one's side, to comfort, to console, and to strengthen. This is also the word that is used to refer to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is our comforter. So that is the meaning of the word encourage. To bring consolation, to strengthen, to comfort, to call to one's side. And you say, come here, come here. Okay, come here. Okay. Not like that. <laughs> I think for some Filipinos it's so offensive, but Americans I think it's just okay for them. It's normal for them too. But if you're a Filipino and somebody did like this to you, I think we're offended. So just say, come here. I don't know with those gestures. <laughs> Hallelujah. And lastly, Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13. But encourage one another daily as long as it is cold today, so that none of you may be hardened by sin's deceitfulness. Amen. You know, as we come to church, we are being encouraged. We are being strengthened. And even if we are going in the wrong way, God somehow is rerouting us, or He is showing us a detour as we encourage, as we show ourselves in the middle of His fellowship. And the last one, the last one in that particular uh, scripture, and all the more as you see the day approaching. You know what, people of God? We need to encourage one another because time is short. What do you mean, Pastor Jay? The day is approaching. Jesus is coming. But Pastor Jay, they have been saying that for the last 2,000 years. Well, it is closer than you think. Amen. Whichever comes first, Jesus or us going to Jesus, I think we will never lose anything if we are always prepared. Amen. I believe it will become harder and harder for us to live holy lives and it will become more and more important for Christians to do life in community with other Christ followers. You know in our generation now, especially in our culture, it is so hard. It is so hard to live as a Christian in a workplace, in our communities right now. That's why we need to be encouraged. We need to be strengthened. Amen. By the church and by one another. Are you with me? In fact, we can see two kinds of movements that is taking place right now. There are Christians who become more sold out to Christ. And there are others who have grown cold. They are unplugged and they are totally unraveling in their relationship with God. James MacDonald again have said, The Church of Jesus Christ is without a doubt the most neglected family resource in the world today. 
All around us, families are trying with all their might to become all that they can be. Yet, many are doing so without the help of the only institution God had created to nurture and to support the family. And what is that? That is the church. If you want to have a strong family, involve your whole family in the church. Amen. Studies have shown that if we do something consistently for 21 days, it will become a new habit. I would encourage you, for the last or for the next four Sundays, come to church. Why, Pastor Jay? Because it will become a habit. That Sunday is something that is reserved for the Lord. I mean, our just service here is from 10 to 12, 12.30. After that, you can do whatever things you want. But if we come to church consistently, it will just bring benefit. Not just for the church, for others, but most importantly, to you. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Hallelujah.